Tom, and uh, good evening to everybody. Um, I'd like to, to thank you all for coming, especially those of you who've heard me speak before. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, I'm waiting I'd, for the words. <laughs> thank you. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for coming, and I'd like to thank our host here for the invitation to speak, which uh, is a great honor, so thank you very much. Now, uh, given all the bad news around us, I thought I'd cheer you up for once. So my theme this evening, it, it comes from an, a very uplifting song by the great Noel Coward. And some of you will have heard it before, but my favorite lines are these. There are bad times around the corner, and the outlook is absolutely vile. <laughs> hooray, hooray, misery's on the way. So I couldn't put it better myself. <laughs> 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 you know, more bluntly, my theme is the decapitalization, and that is to say the long-term impoverishment of the Western economies due to misguided central bank and government policies. I think this is obviously a very dire prospect, but also I would say a rather optimistic one because it presupposes that our economies won't collapse long before then. So I'd like to focus my initial remarks on the US, but I think we in Europe, and especially in the UK and Ireland, not to mention obviously Greece, face an even worse prospect, but I'll come back to that later. So a related theme of my talk is a very old-fashioned theme, which is stewardship, or rather the lack of it. So I'd like to start with a parable, literally. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus recounts the parable of the talents, which you all will know. The master goes away and leaves each of three servants with sums of money to look after in his absence. He then returns and holds them to account. Now the first two have invested wisely and give the master a good return and are rewarded. The third, however, is a wicked servant. He did nothing with the money except bury it in the garden. So he gives his master a zero return and he is punished and thrown into the darkness where there is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, whatever that is. Now, in the modern American version, I think the eternal truth of the original remains. The good stewardship is all important. In this story, in this version, the master is the American public who unwisely entrusts his capital to the stewardship of his supposed servants, the Federal Reserve and the Federal Government. Now, to be fair, these two servants are not especially wicked, but they sure are incompetent. So they run amok, run amok and squander so much of their master's capital that he is ultimately ruined. And it is he, rather than they, who go on to suffer all the wailing and teeth gnashing, not to mention the impoverishment. For their part, the two incompetent servants deny all responsibility good politicians always do. And since there's no accountability in this version, forget about biblical justice here, they ride off into the sunset insisting that none of this was their fault. So let's start with the Fed. Now, since October 79, under Paul Volcker's chairmanship, the Fed's prime monetary goal had been the fight against inflation. This changed with Chairman Greenspan's Humphrey Hawkins' testimony to Congress in February 95. This indicated a shift to soft money, abandonment of monetarism. The Dow then rose above 4,000 the next day and was off to the races. By December 5, 1996, the Dow was already at 6,400, and Greenspan famously expressed his doubts about the market's irrational exuberance. Nonetheless, he did nothing tangible to reinforce his scepticism and pushed interest rates downward over the next three years. Only in 1999 did he begin to take action, pushing the Fed funds rate upwards to an eventual peak of 6.5% in 2000. By that stage, the tech stocks had reached stratospheric levels and then soon crashed. The cycle then repeated. In January 2001, Greenspan began a series of interest rate cuts that saw Fed funds fall to 1% in 2003. He held it at that rate for a year 
and this is most important, short-term interest rates were to remain below inflation for almost four years. This was a much more aggressive monetary policy, and the results are entirely predictable. There was the mother of all liquidity cycles, and yet another massive demand boom, the most notable feature of which was subprime and all that. Greenspan's successor, Ben Bernanke, then continued his predecessor's soft money policy with missionary zeal. He brought Fed funds down to 2% by September 2008, and this was followed, as we all know, by massive monetary expansion. The monetary base expanded by 350%. Fed funds were pushed down to 25 basic points, which is basically nothing. And then we had enormous bailouts and large amounts of quantitative easing, QE. Now, if past, monetary, past expansionary monetary policies led to bubbles, then it stands to reason that we should expect the even more expansionary policies of the last few years to produce new bubbles. This is exactly what we find. So within the US, there are at least three very obvious bubbles all in full swing, each fueled by the flood of cheap money. And these are treasuries, financials, and junk. And I'm skipping over a couple of others, such as stocks and commodities. Now the first bubble is in the treasury bond market. Now this has seen a huge boom since 2007, and this is fueled by a combination of large government deficits, enormous investor demand, and low interest rates pushing prices up to record levels. Now this market is bound to crash. After all, prices can realistically only go down. Now the second bubble is financials. Indeed, I would suggest that the current recovery in financial stocks is almost entirely artificial. Now think about it. The Fed's interest rate policy allows banks to borrow short term at close to nothing and invest at 3% or so in long term treasuries or even more in mortgage backed securities which are government guaranteed anyway. So this enables banks to sit back with their 3% plus spreads, leverage 20 times or more and earn a comfortable 60 percent plus return, basically for doing nothing. So basically becoming a yield curve player is far more profitable and avoids all that tiresome bother and risk of, of actually lending to small businesses. It's therefore no wonder that, that lending to SMEs remains at best anemic. The result is a bizarre situation in which the banks appear to recover whilst their supposed core activity, lending, remain stuck, because the reality is that lending is no longer their core business. Now, we also need to consider that banks' true financial positions are disguised by current accounting rules. These allow practitioners to hide true losses and loot the system by abusing financial models. So you use a model to create fictitious valuations and hence fake profits. You then pay yourself a handsome bonus for the profit, in inverted commas, that you have created. And never mind what happens down the road when the banks crash. There is also, of course, crooked financial engineering. Clever financial engineers are always finding ingenious ways to play the system, to game the system, and are currently hard at it. The most lucrative of these schemes involve gaming the Basel capital rules to create fictitious profits and unlock capital that can then be used for more useful purposes like paying bonuses to clever financial engineers and their managers. The current flavor of the month is the ingenious failed sales scam, which is basically a dastardly transaction that looks like an innocent repo, which is really a backdoor way of hypothecating bank assets and deceiving bank counterparties. They enter into transactions with banks that do, but do not realize that the prime assets that, that appear to buttress the bank's balance sheets have already been furtively pledged to other parties. So these practices secretly decapitalize the banks and are, of course, just another form of looting and presumably fraud. Underlying all this, we need to remember that the banks are only able to continue operating because they're on state life support propped up by repeated bailouts, including, for example, 
lender of last resort, lending, TARP, QE, etc., and government guarantees such as deposit insurance, too big to fail, and so forth. The third bubble is junk, that is to say, sub investment grade bonds. We used to say sub investment grade corporate bonds, but now many sovereign bonds are also junk. Junk is junk. So the last three years have witnessed a huge growth in junk bond issues. And this is extraordinary in the deepest recession since World War II. But the key factor driving this growth is low interest rates. These reduce borrowing costs and, and stimulate borrowing. They also suppress the yields on treasuries, and that encourages yield-seeking investors, who are basically the biggest suckers on the planet, uh, to go for junk, just to get a slightly higher yield. These same causal factors have also given a big boost to the leverage buyout market and have allowed company after company to avoid bankruptcy and indeed to prosper, uh, temporarily that is to say, through aggressive refinancing. Now I would suggest that each of these bubbles I've described is characterized by obvious irrationality. So in the tech boom, my favorite example was pets.com, some of you may remember. Now this was based on the idea that there was money to be made FedExing cat food around the United States. Now, I'm not joking. Um, this company could, yet this company, with this brilliant business plan, could not cover the costs of sending kitty litter through the post, which is what it tried to do. But it forgot to cost for it. It made its IPO in February 2000 and put itself down a mere 288 days later. It's a spectacular record. Isn't it? So let's face it, as an investment, pets.com was a real dog. <laughs> in, in the housing bubble, we had the irrationality of no doc and ninja loans. You're familiar with ninja loans? No income, no jobs, no assets. It's a really clever idea. And house prices in some parts of the US were running at 8 to 10 times annual income. So we had loans being made with no concern, whatever, for whether they could, could be repaid. It's completely crazy, isn't it? In the market for treasuries, we have the irrationality of a classic one-way bet scenario, which is reminiscent of a beleaguered currency facing a speculative attack. In such circumstances, the only rational response is to sell, and yet investors' money keeps pouring in. Now, in the current financials market, we have the irrationality of the banks being apparently profitable, whilst the credit system is still jammed up, and most banks remain dependent on life support. In the current junk market, we have the irrationality of the banks Sorry, we have the irrationality of a major boom in lending to the riskiest corporate governors, uh, corporate customers. So a major boom to the riskiest corporate customers taking place in the middle of a major credit crunch, and in the certain knowledge that many of these borrowers will be will default when interest rates rise. Now we can be confident, I think, that these current bubbles will come to unpleasant ends like their predecessors, but on a potentially much grander scale. The bubbles will then burst in quick succession. I think sooner rather than later, it will dawn on investors that treasurers, treasuries are overvalued. The most likely scenario is that some combination of QE and yawning deficits will cause a further decline in the value of the dollar that shatters foreign holders' confidence. There will then be a rush to the exits in other words, a flight from treasuries on a massive scale, forcing up interest rates and inflicting heavy losses on bondholders, especially those holding long-term bonds. This will then feed through to the bubbles in financials and junk, and these two will collapse. We'll then enter, we will then enter a renewed banking crisis. The old one hasn't gone away. Uh, just a new phase of the crisis, nastier than before. And many highly leveraged firms, financial and otherwise, will go belly up. 
the Treasury's collapse will also trigger an immediate financing crisis for governments at all levels. Now, these financial tsunamis are also likely to overwhelm the Fed itself. The Fed has a balance sheet like that of a highly leveraged hedge fund. It, too, will therefore suffer horrendous losses and is, in fact, already insolvent. The Fed will then have to pay the price for its own past profligacy. In essence, its policy has been like that of an alcoholic with a hangover. It continues drinking to feel better. It puts off the immediate headache, but it just gets worse and worse over time. The simple reality, as Austrian economists have always pointed out, is that structural problems require painful restructuring. It cannot be resolved by mindlessly throwing money at institutions that are fundamentally unsound. We just can't escape that reality. Now, I believe we've now reached a very nasty little end game. So just to summarize, the banks are bust, but propped up by the Fed and the federal government. But the Federal Reserve is also bust. And unfortunately, here's the bad news, the federal government is bust as well. They're all bust. And it gets worse as well. <laughs> now, all the macro indicators now point to renewed inflation. And in fact, US inflation is not the headline 3.6% but more like 11% if we go by the shadow stats estimates which are more reliable and rising. So this, this state of affairs demands that the Federal Reserve raise interest rates sharply and rein in monetary growth. And yet what is the Fed doing? It's holding interest rates as low as it possibly can and printing money feverishly. In this year alone, the monetary base has risen by nearly 30%. If the Fed doesn't raise interest rates, and Bernanke is determined not to, then it risks a hyperinflation. But if the Fed does raise interest rates, then the financial system will collapse. So the banks, the Fed, and even the US government itself are only being kept going by near zero interest rates. So the bottom line is that the whole system is completely unsound and it will collapse like a house of cards as soon as any attempt is made to restore sane interest rates or anything resembling true market discipline. In short, US policymakers have checkmated themselves. Raise interest rates and bring the system down, or keep interest rates low and destroy the currency. Well done, guys. Eh? Anyway, returning, that's just a a warm-up. Return to my main theme. <laughs> you haven't heard the bad news yet. <laughs> Returning to my main theme, Federal Reserve policy over the last 15 years or so has produced bubble after bubble. In each bubble or group of bubbles has been more damaging than its predecessor. Each destroys part of the capital stock by diverting capital into economically unjustified uses. Basically, artificially low interest rates make investments appear more profitable than they really are, and this is especially so for investment, investments <coughs> with long-term horizons. So in Austrian terms, there's an artificial lengthening of the investment horizon. These distortions and resulting losses are then magnified further once the bubble takes hold the end result is a lot of ruined investors and bubble blight. Huge overcapacity in affected sectors. And this has happened again and again. And is happening. We need to consider how periods of prolonged low and often negative real interest rates have led to sharply reduced saving and hence also to lower capital accumulation over time. So even without Federal, bu federal budget deficits, it's manifestly obvious <coughs> that savings rates are inadequate to provide for the maintenance, let alone the growth, of the US capital stock. In other words, the US is eating its own seed corn. Now add in the impact of federal budget deficits of around 10% GDP. We see that the deficits alone take up more than the economy's entire savings. 
without a penny left over for investment, it then becomes necessary to supply US capital needs by foreign borrowing, and hence the persistent and worrying balance of payments <coughs> deficits. And even this borrowing is not enough. Not to put too fine a point on it, savings have been suppressed for close on two decades, preventing the natural accumulation of capital as the baby boomers draw closer to retirement. Meanwhile, much of the country's magnificent and once unmatched capital stock is being poured down a succession of rat holes. Just to be subtle about it. Now, we also have to bear in mind that the federal government is a pretty good capital <coughs> destroyer as well. Okay. The wastefulness of government infrastructure projects is, of course, legendary. And I take as read, I just don't have all the evening, the vast amount of wastage in the recent slew of emergency federal spending programs that we all know, we've all heard so much about. Now, when President Obama came into office, a nice little joke going the rounds was that his Keynesian advisors would have spent a trillion dollars before they worked out where the restrooms were in the White House. And basically, they haven't got any better. So the, the bottom line is that the most spendthrift policies in history have failed abysmally to produce any serious economic recovery. Official unemployment in the US is 10%. Unofficial estimates put it at twice that. This is not a real recovery. Keynesianism has been tested to destruction and has failed again. And however much Keynesians might deny it, the option to keep throwing money around like confetti no longer exists. But all this spending amounts to a fairly serious debt problem. And people tend to focus on official government debt figures. But official government debt is merely the tip of a much larger iceberg. The official debt of the United States, large as it is, is dwarfed by this unofficial debt, the social security and other entitlements such as Medicaid, Medicare and so forth, to which the federal government has committed itself but not provided for. In other words, we're talking about additional debts that, the, that future taxpayers are expected to pay for. Now, recent estimates of the size of this debt are, I think, fair to say, hair-raising. The best recent estimates, uh, and this is best recent, I mean, this is late last year, so it's probably got a lot better since. The best recent estimates put this debt at over $200 trillion. Now, that is a lot of money. And, and just think of it. Imagine a $2 note with 12 zeros after it, okay? plus change and it's rising. Okay. That comes out, by my calculation, well, it's very easy to lose sight of where the decimal point belongs and so forth, but I think this is right. This comes out about half a million dollars for every man, woman, and child in the United States, and it's rising fast. This burden implies punitive tax rates on future employment income, and help, hence major disincentives to work, or at least to declare income. It will also greatly discourage future capital accumulation as investors will fear that there's little point building up investments that will eventually be expropriated by the government. It's happened before, of course. But the bottom line is much simpler. This debt just cannot be repaid. The US is bust, simple as that. Now you might think it, it can't get any worse. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it does. <laughs> Many of the individual states of the Union are in even worse shape. I believe it's 46 out of 50 are believed to be insolvent. And by insolvent, I mean really insolvent. They cannot pay next month's, next six months, next year's pension obligations, this sort of thing. So basically, people are now betting on which state will go belly up first. And then the really bad news is looking at the municipalities. These are already defaulting. And one hears horror stories of others desperately trying to stave off default by slashing basic services, sacking teachers en masse, for example, not being able to afford to send police cadets to the police academy this year, and so forth. 
fairly worrying. Now, I would say that the long-term effect of US economic decapitalization will not necessarily be apparent in day-to-day -day headlines, although we do get the occasional interesting one. But instead, I think the process will be mostly glacial, mostly slow, but utterly devastating in its longer-term impact. Now, for most of its history, the United States has enjoyed many advantages over other countries. Abundant wealth and capital, world-beating education and technology, a highly innovative culture, and under, underlying all this, making it possible, a freer economy. However, the US is far less free than it was 80 plus years ago. Partly because of this, but partly because of the natural ongoing processes of globalization, the US is steadily losing its other advantages as well. It's, it has long since lost many of its advantages of technology and education relative to Europe and Japan. The same process then started relative to the small tiger economies of East Asia, and more recently, relative to the giant economies of China and India. In the long run, American citizens can expect higher living standards than their Asian counterparts only if they can maintain some edge over them. However, as the American capital stock gradually dissipates and their capital stocks rise, that edge becomes increasingly tenuous and living standards must inevitably converge. That means US living standards will go down. We might also, I would suggest, in looking ahead, take heed from the experiences of other once wealthy countries whose economies were crippled by progressive decapitalization. One of these is Britain, of course. The UK was still a wealthy country at the frontier of technological advance in the late 1930s. However, when the war broke out, the government took complete control of the economy and seized its entire capital stock, foreign investment and all. Over the next decades, a bloated state sector and onerous controls then deprived British industry of the capital it needed to refit, and the country went into long-term economic decline. By the late 70s, the UK was being ridiculed as the new sick man of Europe, and British living standards had fallen to half US levels. The other role model to avoid is, of course, Argentina. Now, Argentina was still one of the world's wealthiest economies as late as 1930. It then embarked on wildly extravagant schemes of corruption, nationalization, and income redistribution. Successive governments then tried to restore Argentina's position but without access to adequate capital, were unable to do so. The result was progressive impoverishment, repeated debt defaults, and the country's descent into its present socialist squalor. And a GDP per head that comes somewhere in the world rankings between Gabon and that paragon of a modern, well-run well economy, Libya. <laughs> Pretty good record, eh? Now, you might think I'm a little pessimistic here. <laughs> so let's look at this another way. Let's look at what a checklist for a healthy economy would look like and see how we square up to that. So I'll offer you 10 checkpoints. Number one, a sound monetary framework. Now, in the US, there's no longer any serious attempt to control inflation. Inflation is both high and rising. Things are not so bad over here just yet. But then again, the Eurozone is not exactly a poster child for sound money. And public confidence in fiat money everywhere is rapidly disappearing. Okay. Number two, sound accounting standards. Now, getting the numbers right is the absolute bedrock of economic calculation. As Bill Clinton might have said, it's the account stupid. And what do we have? We have IFRS accounting standards that allow banks to manufacture fake profits, hide expected losses, 
and do away with the time-honored principle that accounts should be prepared prudently. So the bottom line is that we now have to work with accounts that cannot be trusted. And just look at the recent shenanigans over the 25 billion black hole in, in RBS's account. So number three, real interest rates should be stable and comfortably positive. Well, this is very important for both longer term capital accumulation and sound money. But instead, as I pointed out, real interest rates have been negative, not only in the US, but also in many other countries since 2008. And in the US, they're moving south big time. Very bad sign. So number four, healthy savings and capital accumulation. Uh, no. Savings rates are near zero, and in some cases negative. This is hardly a surprise when you look at interest rates. There's no incentive to save. So number five, a sound banking system. Now, I don't even know where to begin <laughs> discussing this, and you know, we haven't got all night. So, first off, the fact that most banks are on state life support is not a good sign. Nor is the fact that they use unreliable accounting rules. Nor is the fact that most of their reported profits come from yield curve riding, derivatives and high frequency trading, activities that are of low social utility at best and are downright destructive at worst. Then you have to consider the bank's losses. Since 2007, UK banks have lost over 180% of their capital. That's a lot of money to lose. Irish banks have lost almost 300% of their capital. And if that doesn't persuade you, just look at the banks now in the UK. It is an open secret that both RBS and Lloyds are bust. And then, of course, there is a particular problem for the UK in that the UK is overbanked. Now, leaving aside the dubious profitability of the UK banking system, this means that the UK banking sector must at some time shrink, and this is already happening. The longer term impact on the economy is then potentially devastating. And one can anticipate a future in which much of the finance sector simply disappears and the London Docklands, Docklands reverts to its earlier state of dereliction, fit only for barbed wire tattooed thugs and rottweilers. <laughs> Given that the UK has already hollowed out its industrial base, we are then looking at a future that is much worse than that of the United States. And where are we going to earn our living? That, then, on number six, if we were to have central banks, I prefer we didn't, they should be conservative and solvent. Instead, we have central banks printing money like crazy, and all the major central banks have leverage ratios that are worse than many of the banks on the eve of the crisis, which all went bust, which many of which went bust. Bottom line is that the central banks are insolvent. Okay, public finances in good shape. Well, you work it out. With unfunded liabilities of half a million dollars per person in the US and rising, and figures for the UK not that far short, you can do the maths. And then, of course, there's the pigs. So let's move on. Number eight, sustainability. Well, what do we have? We have fiat money entering its death cycle, we have a bus banking system, the central bank's bus, the government's bus. So we don't really have much sustainability either, except perhaps in the eyes of Paul Krugman and his alien space invaders from a Keynesian galaxy far, far away. <laughs> so number nine, small government, low taxes. Well, the government is now at 50% of the economy, taxes are at crippling levels, so what do you think? And number 10, free markets. Of course we have free markets, except for all those mountains of onerous regulation with a lot more on the way. So the bottom line is that we score an F on every single criteria, zero out of 10. So it's not just the US that is up the creek without a paddle, but most of the West as well. So instead of asking which countries are bust, it would be simpler to ask which are not. And what are they? Well, Canada, are more or less by accident and design, Australia, Ditto, New Zealand. And in Europe, we have Norway, Switzerland, Bulgaria, the Baltics, and that's it. So the long-term prospect for us all is bleak indeed. But with a bit of luck, we might not even survive to see it. 
I think you'd agree with me, this has brought us to a fairly desperate situation in which the old capitalist ethos has been replaced with one where the profits and risk-taking have become privatized and the losses dumped on the taxpayer. The financiers have carried out a quiet coup d'etat in which they now have their grip firmly on our wallets and the theft is openly supported by political leaders who should be defending our interests. Underlying this is the complete breakdown of the old systems of, of control in both finance and politics. Neither policymakers nor bankers have any serious interest in the long-term survival of anything. We must understand this. Both the financial system and the political system have become utterly depraved. The question is, what do we do about it? Nearly finished, just a little bit more. To start with, we should recognise it's not the end of the world, <coughs> it just seems like it. And societies have recovered from much worse problems in the past with the right policies and the right leadership. And one thinks, of course, of post-war Germany. Any reforms need to be based on a diagnosis of underlying problems. And one of the most important here is that policymakers fail to take account of the long-term consequences of their own actions. And of course, this should not cause any surprise. The, the political environment encourages them to focus on the short term. It's always easier to kick the can down the road for someone else to pick up. As far as monetary policy is concerned, these short-termist incentives create an inbuilt expansionary bias. And the solution is to build in barriers to contain this bias. The key here is to reduce, or better still eliminate, discretionary powers. And this would put a stop to those who would meddle with the short-term interest rates and kill the asset, cycle, the asset bubble cycle at its root. Now the ideal way to do this is to abolish central banks and revert to some form of commodity standard. The obvious candidate is a gold standard. I'm not saying that it would be perfect, of course, only that a gold standard would be vastly better than what we now have. It also has a very credible track record and a perfect endorsement that the interventionists hate it. The second step is to resolve the banks. This involves putting the banks through a fast track insolvency process to clean them up and recapitalize them and put them back out to normal business. This inevitably will require massive liquidations in effect, a painful hangover rather than a continued drinking binge. The medicine will be painful, but the alternative will be much, much worse. Relatedly, we also need to restore sound accounting standards. And on that, I can only encourage you all to support Steve Baker's recent private member's bill, which would do just that. A clap for Steve, who's on the last Third, given that most of our governments are already insolvent, they must go through bankruptcy too. So we must engineer state default. And if you think this is extreme, just think of the alternative. If young people want to have any chance of a life other than slavery, working longer, working harder, paying more taxes to cover their predecessors' spending, to get nothing back in return for themselves, then default is the only option. The only question then is how to do it. And we need to do it in the least damaging way to avoid the horrendous consequences that would occur if our governments continue to blunder about and destroy everything in sight. Fourth, we need to restore limited government. Government needs to be rolled back and taxes simplified. This means a low flat tax rate, the abolition of tax-based incentives to borrow, and the removal of tax penalties from saving investment and the transfer of wealth between generations. I would also suggest two other constitutional reforms of great importance. First is a ban on any government guarantees. This would rule out deposit insurance, bailouts, too big to fail, etc. And a balanced budget amendment that would prohibit government debt issue. This would put a stop to government, to policymakers kicking the can down the road and force legislators to confront the immediate consequences, <coughs> the immediate costs of their own spending policies. Finally, I think these policies would give our children and grandchildren the possibility of a future worth having, assuming, of course, 
that policymakers and financiers don't manage to destroy our civilization before that. And on that cheery note, I will say good night and thank you very much. Kevin, thank you very much. Um, if anybody wants to join me with the Kool Aid, it's in the bar afterwards. So we've got the. We've got time for questions, um, so hands, please. Uh, Brian, you were first. Um, Kevin, you might have, come back over to the well, Kevin, have you given that talk in the United States? I gave some of it, yeah. And what was the response? It was very positive. Um, I talked, what I missed out in the United States, I, I delivered some of this at the Cato Monetary Conference last November, and I made a point that we should return back to uh, government to the levels of the great Coolidge administration in the 1920s. That went down very well, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, David. Kevin, you've, uh, you've prescribed the treatment that ought to be taken. If it's not taken, what do you think will happen? <laughs> well, that was what the earlier bit of the talk was about. <laughs> Actually, well, that's a serious answer. I think what we will do is we'll see repeated bailouts. Uh, but the system, each bailout, and in fact each delay in, in fixing it, just makes the whole system weaker and weaker and weaker. So I think it's not a case of what the next bailout is, it, it's a case that the whole thing will collapse sooner or later if we don't. And I think the choice is as simple as that. Now, and that could lead to 1930s style horrors, breakdown of democracy, the rise of all sorts of ugly, it, it's a horrific uh, possibility, it's highly likely. One more in the front row and then who's in the back? Yeah, okay. You first and then we'll head back. So two things. Do the, the rise of the Bitcoin and the recent bill that was suggested that a basket of currencies could be legal tender in the UK, does that give you confidence? And maybe the second one, this excessive focus, almost zealotry on the idea that we split investment banking from retail banking, but still offer limited liability to retail banking. Doesn't that seem wrong-handed and the individuals like Vince Cable uh, are misunderstanding what got us into the crisis in the first place, but like the fact that Alan Greenspan offered limited liability back in the Reagan era. Well, three things there. On, on the Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin is a great example of how the private sector can, can, can come up with solutions that we couldn't imagine in the past, so it's all to be welcomed. Um, the business about the, the cars or bill, it's nice to see that people are going back to look at competing currencies and how that might be useful. I think we need to it's, it's nice to have that given attention. Um, for me, however, uh, the key issue is legal tender. It's not to make other currencies legal tender, but to abolish legal tender. Um, but, but I understand what, what, uh, what Carswell's trying to do is, is admirable. And then thirdly, um, so what was the, the third? Retail, the retail banking, um, but still offering limited liability for retail. Well, I think limited liability is a key part of our underlying problem. Uh, I'm realistic enough, even I have got some degree in political realism, I, although I'd like to roll back limited liability, I think it would suffice it, 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 to, to, to just extend the personal liability of key decision makers, which would, would come close to achieving that. As for vicars and ring fencing, that's just a waste of time. I think. Okay, just uh, can you hear at the back when the questions are being answered, or is yes. it a bit tricky? You can. Okay. Um, yes, you know. Hi, Kevin. Um, you mentioned briefly that the US needs to maintain their edge against China and India. Yeah. Um, what do you think that they might start to develop um, and so gather this edge? Because they're not very competitive in um, quite a few areas now. I agree. Um, and the answer is I don't know, uh, except that I think the political system in the US is still a lot better uh, in terms of freedom than it is in the United States. So the edge will come from that. It doesn't come from English language. It doesn't come from IT increasingly. It doesn't come from science anymore, I don't think, either. It has to come from a freer environment. I mean, it's up to the US whether they do it or they don't. But, you know, the fate of Argentina is, is there for all to see. Uh, David, yes. yes. You, you touched on the horrors of the 30s. Yes. Uh, do you find it worrying that, that the world's biggest debtor com country is also the world's greatest military power? Yes. Comment on that at all? Well, I mean, I think I think we're seeing we're seeing kind of fairly ugly U.S. imperialism. Um, 
and the only saving grace on it is that the Americans can no longer afford it so much. And I think, so that would sort of write itself to some extent. But, my, I mean, I'm a complete classical liberal. I believe in peace and free trade, and, you know, and, and a local police and nothing much else. And, and I think, uh, I just feel very sad to see the sort of meddling in the wars that are going on, and of course the danger of the worst things to follow. Yes. Someone, yeah, Bruno. I think you said you, at some stage you regard interest rates as too low. Yeah. And also, I think you said we're overbanked. So yeah. Share those views completely. When I make those arguments, what I call interventionist free marketers, people who believe that the government's going to make it all right, they say these, these are just natural. The interest rate is the natural rate, and we have a comparative advantage in banking, so we should have a very big banking system. But I, I personally don't regard them as natural. I'm interested to hear how you explain that. <coughs> well, I think there's two issues. On, on the latter one, which is easier, um, I think the banking sector that we see is anything but a free market product. I think it's basically become a huge rent extraction machine. And uh, the UK is caught in a terrible dilemma that, in effect, the, if we close it down or let it go, it will devastate the Southeast economy and probably put the country into national bankruptcy. And if we don't do that, you know, we're just subsidizing, encouraging more of this rent seeking. So yeah, th th that's a consequence of our own past policies. It's Ireland and Iceland have made the mistake even bigger in, relative to their economies. In, in terms of interest rates, I mean, you, you allude to, to, to the sort of old debates about neutral money and stuff like that. We, we don't really know what the natural interest rate should be. The closest we can come to is say, well, let's agree a monetary standard. Let's say it's a gold standard, it could be something else. Then that would give us interest rates that were reasonable with minimum of intervention. That's probably as good as we're ever going to get. What we do know is that meddling with the interest rate has caused no end of trouble, which is why you know, I spent 20 minutes trying to, to emphasize that. Um, just in the back row there. Uh, two questions from there. Oh, just one for now, and I'll come back to you if there's time. We'll get everybody here. Uh, what do you think of selling uh, product of target? Um, I don't agree with it, and I never have. Um, George and I have debated this ever since he came out with it. I, I personally, as a anything that pushes nominal interest rates down to zero is, is a bit weird to me. Um, I, but I think I think the real question is a choice between a price level standard, if you like, and a gold standard. Now, in the past, I've, I've veered between the two. Speaking as an economic theorist, I could give you reasons why I think a suitable price level thing would be good. But as a practical matter, I think there is one front runner now in terms of commodity money, and that is a gold standard. So the question then is how to, how to achieve it. Steve Baker. I'm just grateful. Good news, Kerry. I asked the Chancellor today in the Bitcoin Summit if you would consider the risks and incentives in IFRS, and he said yes. Oh, wonderful. So there's some good news there. An eminent British economist recently said to me that uh, free marketeers have never agreed what a proper free market monetary system would look like. Do you think there's any hope that there could be consensus on a proper free market monetary reform? Yes, I do, Steve. I think, I think this is one reason why um, I think that the gold standard or something close to that, combined with a liquidationist, I'm not saying we should let the bank banking system collapse, but we need to reform it in a way which clears all the rubbish out of the system. I think in the Cobden Centre, we are very close in our discussions to agreeing on it. And it's only a few quirky bits and pieces around the edge that cause any real friction. So I think, yes, that we could agree with something that most of us would be happy with. Right. I've got three people stood up and then Dominic. Let's have a show of hands. Who has got the question? that they want to ask before we close tonight, so I can go one, two, three. Okay, right, so um, i go with you first. You've been waiting for a while now. <laughs> okay, yes. um, you dropped a line in there uh, um, earlier about uh, where's the effect that the, the fiat money, uh, fiat currencies sort of approaching or in their end game, and that's very much also the thesis of uh, FIFA and uh, some others. Um, how do you see that playing out politically and economically? Um, I think my, my, my fear is that we'll have maybe a couple more bailouts and the system will gradually just get manifestly weaker and weaker. 
And before we know it, we'll see inflation on, on almighty levels. And everybody will be wondering how we are so stupid as to get ourselves in that situation. So I th that's the best I can give you. I, I agree with Detlev uh, that um, fiat money is in its end game. And are you thinking along the lines of, of collapse and chaos or yes. just some reversion you know, to a commodity standard? No, no, actually what I see is the chaos, monetary chaos, hyperinflation, and then all sorts of nasties coming out through the woodwork. And it's really important that while we still have a chance to do something, that's why I made the comment, you know, let's, let's try and do something before our political masters destroy everything. You know, they've destroyed a lot already, but we've still got it to play for. But my biggest worry is, is a repeat of the 1930s, collapse of democracy and government of Okay, in quick succession, uh, Tom, Miles, and then Dominic, and then, yes, if we've got time, come to you there. Uh, Kevin, how much encouragement could or should we take from the fact that people, at least at the policy making level, are talking about things like living wills and so forth with banks? I know we have our own, quite our own scepticism about whether they really mean it, but the fact that people are even prepared to talk about the fact that banks can be restructured, dealt with, or quietly put, put to sleep does suggest that there is some realism, at least in some corners. What, what do you make of that debate? No, I, 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 get, I take a little bit of comfort from that, but not too much, because I think we're a long way from mm. any sense of political realism. And, um, and we need more people like Steve in Parliament, basically. I think we're a long way. It's not, you know, it's 5% where we need to be. You spoke about our governments having to face up to the circumstances of their fiscal incapacity. The only way I know which that happens is when the governments get engaged with the banks through the club mechanism to go through a process of renegotiation of haircuts. That can't happen in the real world on a large scale. So aren't, what, is, aren't we really going to see the old uh, the old policy of the creditors' friend, a little bit of inflation, maybe a little bit more inflation. Isn't that, in fact, where we're headed? I think that's partly where it will go. But I also think, um, and that, of course, worries me as well, because, you know, that, that, that's what the Germans did in the 1920s. Um, but I don't think it will be enough. I, I think we, we need to see structured default. We, we'll see default anyway, formal default, not just inflation. And the question is, do we, uh, do we try and manage the thing sensibly, or do we just let it happen and, and watch the, the chaos start? And now, uh, Dominic. Um, how would you make an orderly transition to using gold as money again? And what do you make of the argument that the finite amount of gold in the world limits economic expansion? Um, I'm not too bothered about the latter argument. I mean, uh, you could argue that the finite amount of gold is a good thing. Yeah, but I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm relaxed about that. How you implement it, um, I would, what I would do is I would take the central bank, convert it into a currency board with a, with a gold peg. And, and my model here is the 1819 Resumption Act, which defined the pound as a certain unit of gold. That's what, why we have the, the legend on the pound note, I promise to pay the bearer on demand, which is, is exactly a reflection of what it used to be in the 19th century. So I, th I think technically it can be done. Uh, currency boards have been used very successfully in Eastern Europe. Um, I would just push it that bit further and have a gold peg. The problem that I have, and I haven't really thought it through, but it worries me, is that because gold is going up through the roof, if we were to adopt a gold standard tomorrow, it would mean the, the, the pound would go through the roof, and this would create all sorts of problems for our export. Yeah. So. At some level, we need some interim arrangement with a, tra a transitional peg before the, the, to let the gold market settle down. But the problem is not the gold market. It's not so much that gold is in a boom. It's rather that the fiat money, the fiat currencies are in a collapse. If, if you were to go to a gold standard, um, you know, so much paper has been printed that you have to revalue gold much higher than it is even now. Potentially, yeah. That, that's the big transitional problem. It's a big okay. problem. Um, if we maybe take a couple of round, uh, sort of rounds of questions just to close. Um, I've got chap there, <laughs> you, and then David in the front row. Who else has got a burning question bubbling up? One, two, 
possibly. So maybe we'll do a second round then. Um, so short, short uh, questions and, and, and you know punchy answers if we could. Uh, we'll start with you and then you and then. <coughs> So, uh, although Mr. Bernanke didn't mention it in his recent uh, Jackson Hole speech, there have been rumours of the so-called new monetary policy operation twist. Do you think it will simply fuel uh, short-term yield markets, short-term treasury uh, markets, um, and does it have any credibility at all? Can we take the second one now as well? To inject a note of optimism, um, ancient Rome took 180 years to die uh, between Diocletian and 470 AD. I'm wondering if there are any lessons to be learned from this period. <laughs> the interesting device of paying off the Huns at the gates of Rome with money in 410 AD rather than fighting them. And Davis, <laughs> If uh, governments carry on as they are now, how long do you think it will be before the fan gets really, really dirty? Yeah. <laughs> well, those two last questions seem to tie together. <laughs> well, to answer that one question, I think it's fairly dirty already. It's a very dark shade of grey, but not quite black. But there isn't much uh, much light there, so I think things are pretty dire. But obviously, as I've tried to emphasise, it could get a lot more dire. Yeah. In terms of the Roman Empire, it's very interesting that you state this, because I've always had this analogy at the back of my mind. Always. I'm also reminded, I mean, if I was a Roman citizen and I was watching the collapse of the Roman Empire, I would probably barely notice it, unless it was at a key event like the fall of Rome or the fall of Africa or the end of the legions in Britain. So most of the time you'd see this collapse. It's a collapse is something that we see because we know the historical record, but people at the time, it, w it would have seemed much more stable than it appears to be. You would have noticed it if you were the son of a butcher and a baker forced by Diocletian to be a butcher or a baker whether you liked it or not. That's true, but that was just Diocletian and they did they did reform their currency. They did after. introduce a prices and incomes yes. policy yeah. and force by that's that only that, Yeah. Third century. And as for Bernanke's monetary twist? I don't believe anything that Bernanke <laughs> <laughs> not a very good answer I'm afraid. Um, and there was David and yes and Steve are you still yeah, that was a good question. Why should banks be allowed to have property rights in their customers' deposits? Okay, one, two. Yes, surely if uh, currency was pegged to gold, gold's meteoric rise would immediately stop. It only rises so fast because people have falling trust in money. Uh, once they were pegged, people would then trust money as much as gold. Perhaps to end on a semi frivolous note. Um, my grandfather's money came from the Argentine, so the 1930s didn't do a lot of good. I now work for South American Gold Company. Have I a chance to rebuild our fortunes? So, <laughs> let's do the gold yes, first and then um, we'll come to Steve's question. The, the gold thing, the, the, I don't believe in international monetary cooperation. It's not going to work. The, the practical question is, what do we do? Forget about the rest of the world. So if we went to gold, we would only be piggybacking on that gold market, which is already going through the roof. So I think the problem is a very real one. Okay. And the idea that we can all do it collectively is it's never going to happen. Going back to Steve's question, I do not believe that banks should have property rights over other people's property. Oh. <laughs> 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 Took my short answer to heart. Kevin, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.